Does Stanford's Alpaca show Tesla how to do full self-driving more efficiently? And could that actually lead to a much more extended lifetime for Tesla's Hardware 3? Plus, full self-driving 11.3.3 is rolling out, and there is a discussion about embodiment versus disembodiment in artificial general intelligence. Let's take a look. <laughs> Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. Before I get to the main topic du jour, I want to note that 11.3.3 or 22.45.12 is released. Again, notice that that is a 22 number, so if you are on a 23 version of Tesla software, you're not going to be eligible to receive this just yet because they can't go backwards. So anyway, be that as it may, it looks like all of the notes are the same. Chuck Cook noted this morning that there is a new note about Park Assist, but that since seems to have disappeared, which is rather odd, so I don't know if if that was just an oopsie and they put it in there or not. But anyway, the basic idea was that the car was going to give you alerts when you were parking and try to make it a little bit easier for you to park in tight parking places and things. So it's possible that that is going to be 11.3.4. It's also possible that they might update the release notes. Don't know at this point. I still don't even have version 11 of the software. We're hoping that maybe 11.3.3 rolls out more widely. So fingers crossed that uh, all of us, the broader public, will get it very, very soon. Next up, I want to quickly touch on a debate that is really interesting, very intriguing to me. Jan Lacuna is talking about this yesterday. He said the debate that is part of the Philosophy of Deep Learning Conference, sponsored by Columbia University and others, asked the question, do large language models need sensory grounding for meaning and understanding? And in reference to that, Lacun actually referenced Jitendra Malik, who gave a talk at UC Berkeley just a few days ago called The Sensorimotor Road to Artificial Intelligence. And all of this is wrapped up in the question of whether large language models, which are disembodied, in other words, they just exist in a computer on the internet or in a sandbox or something, if they can ever become truly generally intelligent or have agency. And as people who've been watching this channel for a while probably know, I'm very firmly in the camp that embodiment is important for consciousness. It grounds what we are. It gives us all common shared experiences and things so that we're not just hallucinating inside of a jar, which is what a lot of people call large language models. They just hallucinate because they really don't understand reality at all. They're just you know, <laughs> they're just hallucinating. They're just dreaming inside of a jar. And yes, it is possible that all of us are dreaming too and that we're all in a simulation or something. But, you know, disregarding all of those extreme possibilities and you really can't prove those one way or the other anyway. So we have to take it as we are conscious but also embodied beings, which means we exist in the world. I can move my hand around and feel the air. I can touch my nose and I can feel, you know, that kind of stuff. So that we have perceptions. We can feel things. We can see things. We can hear things. And that's part of our consciousness and part of what gives us agency. Anyway, I've done other videos on this. You can check that out as well. And if people want to see me do a video on this topic particularly, I would love to dig into it more deeply. Uh, it looks like a really interesting debate. I'm hoping that they replay it and have it available online because I missed the original, which really, really sucks. So anyway, definitely let me know in the comments or on Twitter or something if you are interested in a more deep dive into this topic because I find it quite intriguing. All right, so speaking of speculation and specifically in reference to the title, which will probably involve something like FSD Inception, I want to discuss Stanford's recent research where they created a model called Alpaca using two other large language models kind of bashing them into each other. Basically, one taught the other one. Anyway, I did a video on this. You can check it out up here. I go into more detail in that video. But the super nutshell idea here is what they did was they took ChatGPT 3.5 to create training prompts for a much, much smaller model, approximately a 7 billion parameter model that was released by Meta called Llama. And of course, then they had to name their model Alpaca because it's similar to a Llama. Anyway, they were able to leverage the quality of ChatGPT3 and the extensive training and expensive training that went into it to be able to train a much, much simpler model that's publicly available online to do nearly as well. And they say it actually, in some cases, exceeds GPT 3.5. And, you know, again, we're talking about something that's 7 billion parameters versus about 174 billion parameters. So a massive, massive savings in this model size, massive savings in, in training costs and things like that. And the reason why I'm calling this FSD Inception is I'm borrowing this from Anastasia in tech because she did AI Inception. I actually scooped her on this topic. I actually talked about it a couple of days before her, whatever. But anyway, her title was way better than mine. And I was like, oh, I'm stealing that title. So I'm calling this one FSD 
PTSD inception. Basically, the idea, if, if you haven't seen the movie, not too many spoilers, but they go into dreams and they dream levels down and levels down, and each of those has effects on the way up. And as you go down, each of the layers has like an outsize effect on the layer above it. So anyway, I think that's a pretty cool way of thinking about this, since these computers are dreaming anyway. So, okay, John, what do you mean by FSD inception? What I mean here is that Tesla, they, they already do this to some extent, and they may actually do this in the way that Stanford is talking about. I, I'm not sure, so that's why I said this is speculation. But basically, they have their supercomputer cluster and probably some pieces of Dojo at this point operating. So these are huge computers that can contain massive models. I mean, we can be talking about hundreds of billions of parameter models that can learn how to do full self-driving extremely well. And part of what they do, of course, is learning how to do auto labeling and all of that kind of stuff. But that's all offline. That's all stuff that only exists on the server. But what needs to happen with the actual driving models is those eventually have to fit on your little hardware three slash hardware four board that sits in your car and operates as a mobile computer. Because again, it also can't take massive amounts of energy because then you couldn't drive anywhere because the battery would drain, you know, just going into the computer. So basically you have a very small energy budget you have a small memory budget and you have a small compute budget relative to these large things. So how do you distill these massive models down into something that can operate in a mobile type device. And Tesla engineers have discussed this before, but never been very specific about distilling down the large models into smaller models that can actually fit onto these chips and operate in real time at like 35, 36 frames per second. And that's a necessity, obviously. It can't run very slowly or else that's also going to be a problem. So anyway, they've talked about distilling this, but they haven't really talked about how. And there's kind of more, you know, semi-traditional techniques in neural networks for distilling large models down to smaller ones. But what I'm saying here is that the alpaca model could be really interesting. What Tesla could do is take a relatively lightweight model that fits within the hardware three very comfortably, needless to say the hardware four, which has more memory and more compute power and all of that kind of stuff. So anyway, even disregarding the, the new hotness that's coming out, the new hardware four, on the older computer, they could take a much simpler model that is, you know, couldn't operate at all well without being trained. And they could utilize these very advanced models to basically teach the small model how to drive essentially as well as these large models that took a lot of compute power, a lot of expense, a lot of human engineering to train. And so if they could do this, what would this actually mean to full self-driving? Well, what it would mean would be that the computer itself would be able to run a very lightweight model that it could easily handle with its current memory and compute capacity within the energy budget at 35, 36 frames per second, all of that stuff could be done at a quality level that is equal to or very, very close to models that are 10 or 100 times larger and take gigantic machines to actually operate on. And that is a really intriguing possibility here because as the Stanford paper and others are beginning to show, data is really king. It's not the size of the model nearly as much as it is the amount and quality of data. So if you can use the pre-trained models, so you can call them pre-trained FSD or something like that. And there are multiple models. We're not talking about one neural network for this. You know, Tesla's FSD is multiple, multiple neural networks. And at least as of a year or two ago, they used to call it the Hydronet because it had kind of a trunk and then a bunch of heads that split off and everything. So this isn't nearly as simple as a large language model because it's a whole bunch of things and they all interact with each other. But if you can take the ones that are the biggest ones and the biggest bottlenecks, and you could reduce those to very small number of parameters but those parameters don't know what they're doing. They're not trained, but then you can take the really good pre-trained model to generate billions of examples, right? So instead of just having a 10 million or a hundred million or even a billion miles of driving, you could have tens of billions or hundreds of billions of virtual miles of driving. And these hundreds of billions of virtual miles can be done very, very efficiently because it can be done in a way that's specifically designed to train this more lightweight model. And if this methodology works, and again, I don't know, like I said, it's speculation, but if this would work, you could say go from a 200 billion parameter neural network model that they might be 
operating. I don't think they operate anything that big because they can't fit it onto their hardware. But anyway, you could, in theory, train a gigantic model that has hundreds of billions of parameters in size and then squish that down into something that's on the order of 10 billion parameters. So you could have you know, an order of magnitude reduction in the amount of parameters, which also reduces the amount of time it takes to compute, the energy budget, all of that kind of stuff flows from the fact that this model is much, much smaller and much more lightweight. But if you can utilize the very big expensive model to train the smaller model and to give it just the right prompts, just the right inputs to train it, you could get this smaller model apparently because of these papers to be effectively as good as the large model. And that is a huge breakthrough if that does work. So again, I wanna be very, very clear that this is complete speculation. I don't know how Tesla is operating and I don't know if they're doing that or even considering doing something like this. But if they are, that it might give a lot more life to older hardware like Hardware 3 if they can really shrink down the size of the model and make it much more lightweight to compute at inference time. And just to circle back to the philosophy of deep learning conference that I referenced at the beginning of this video, one really interesting thing about Tesla's full self-driving that highly differentiates it from large language language models, generative art, or any of that kind of stuff, is that Teslas are embodied. They are robots in the world, right? They're taking input, they're processing that input, and they're outputting it to do something in the world, as in drive through the world. But what that means is that every time it's doing an action, like if it turns the steering wheel or presses the accelerator, it's also getting feedback, which means that there is a distinct feedback loop between the full self-driving and the real world, which means that if this embodiment argument is true, a Tesla has a greater degree of possibility of becoming conscious or having agency in the world. If embodiment is the most important thing, then a car has more chance of becoming conscious than any of these large language models or generative art models. And that is really intriguing and interesting. Certainly, I think people would be comfortable with the idea of something like Optimus, like a Tesla bot, a humanoid robot, becoming conscious and having agency. But what would happen if we got to the point where our car, you know, if the first thing that became sort of semi-conscious or had agency was your vehicle? It doesn't look like a person. It looks like an object. It looks like something that transports you around. But what if this did start to have agency and interact with the world in interesting and complex ways? Just throwing that out there. It's a really interesting idea. And I was like, well, that's kind of intriguing. So I'll throw that out as a final thought for this morning. All right. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it fun and interesting and thought provoking. If you did, please do like it so other people can find the video. And of course, consider subscribing for more of this kind of content. A little side note, it looks like we're going to be picking up a Tesla Model 3 black on black very, very shortly. Unfortunately, it's down in Savannah. We want to pick it up before the March 31st deadline that potentially might see the $7,500 US tax credit go away. So it looks like the last gas thing in the entire household is about to go away. And if anybody in the Atlanta area happens to want a Mazda CX-5 with 73,000 miles on it, just let me know. <laughs> Direct message me on Twitter or something. Anyway, in the meantime, we're going to be very excited. And we, of course, will do a video on the new Model 3 as we get it. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. Thank you all so much for your support and the, the enjoyable conversations. I really do appreciate it. It's wonderful being part of this community. And of course, if you want to join said community, just check out the link in the description. And if you're interested in a whole bunch of really cool merch, check out our merch store. Link is in the description. We have Tesla Bot t-shirts, the Tesla meme t-shirt, success is a possible outcome, 4680 battery cells. All of that stuff is on t-shirts, mugs, tumblers, and on and on. So check it out. And finally, don't forget, we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how going shopping for a solar roof, a power wall, or anything on Amazon helps out the channel. In the meantime, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.